Welcome, Hebron Online Jasper County Jail in DeMont Wheatfield. It's a good day, and I've got a good message. Even if you're not a Christian, I think this message really will bless your life. Uh, I want you to know, um, no matter what happened last night, it's a great day to be at church. No one's perfect, everyone's welcome. And uh, what we're gonna be doing is, uh, I'm gonna tell a story in this message. We're gonna study 2 Samuel 11 and 12, a continuation from last week. And you'll still be able to get this message this week, but if you watch last week, you'll have a deeper view on it. And then I'm gonna make some points, and then I'm gonna make one more bonus point. It's like a secret level at the end of Sonic. You know, remember Sonic 2, that secret like coin level you could get? That's what we're gonna do is uh, find that secret level. So anyway, I think you'll find this very, very helpful. I'm excited about it and I hope it blesses your life. But um, to start with a story, my dad grew up on the water. He was always, always on the water. His parents had a lake house or it was their main house on White Bear Lake in Minnesota. And him and my mom actually bought a house just a quarter mile down from where my dad grew up on the same lake and raised my brother and I there. And uh, so it was lots, lots of fun stories like, oh man, when I was a kid, I used to actually, I'll tell you when you're older, a lot of that going on. But a ton of fun. And then um, a little over 10 years ago, my parents and my wife and I decided to buy a house and live together, have a communal living situation on the Mississippi River in Minnesota. We just had this beautiful house in Minnesota. It was gorgeous. It was awesome. We've always lived on water. And uh, one of the I would say the biggest drawback about taking this church in Northwest Indiana is the fact that there are no lakes here. It's a big deal for us and our family. It's like, man, there's just no water. Like, it's not as bad as Illinois. <laughs> Nothing's as bad as Illinois. But anyway, it's still bad. You know, like, what are we going to do? It's whatever. And uh, eventually, after we moved here, uh, my mom and dad got a cottage on Lake Schaefer, a cabin there. And it's perfect for our families to enjoy. We absolutely love it. But the cabin is pretty rustic. It uh, doesn't have a foundation. It's just stringers, half of them broken, sitting on cinder blocks that are on the ground. There's no, there's no concrete base on it, whatever. But it stood the test of time. It's been standing for 78 years, over under on it, making to 80. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's been there and back again for sure. But anyway, the, the big issue that I have with it right now is keeping animals out. There's like mice, as far as mice go, there's no chance. Like the mice can just get in there willy-nilly. Bugs, of course. Um, we had a family of raccoons that moved in a few years ago which some of you who are clueless think, oh, cute, I love raccoons, guardians of the galaxy. I mean, they're just adorable. They're not, okay? They're super loud, they make a huge mess, and they are, oh my goodness, when they were living in our attic when we came in, it sounded like there was a bunch of like Labradors up there, like just so much noise and breathing and scratching and clawing, it's very awkward. And uh, boy, did they wreck that attic. I'm telling you, they, the OSB behind all the siding, like that particle board, they tore it all down. They tore out all the insulation. And now it's just vinyl, yellow siding, the sunlight shining through, and that's it. That's all. So uh, anyway, we used something called raccoon poison to get rid of the raccoons. And supposedly, here's how it works. Raccoon poison makes the animals super thirsty. They eat it, they get super thirsty, and they go out to get water and they die. Now, our raccoon poison worked in that it killed the raccoons. It didn't work in that the raccoons didn't go out to get water. They just died up there in the attic. Here's the really gross part is a normal person would go up there and clean it all up in normal times, but the time that they died three years ago was in the middle of a global event that made it really hard to get N95 masks. You know what I'm talking about and PPE and stuff. And uh, raccoon poop is supposedly hazardous, you know, roundworm, all that stuff. So uh, I just figured I'd wait a little bit you know, until I could get some PPE to do it. And it's been three years. So still going on up there. And I know this is a place where no one's perfect and everyone's welcome, okay? (laughs) That's it. Kind of makes you not want to go there though, because every once in a while you just get the the, the waft of rotting flesh and that's kind of a downer. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that does not smell pleasant. And I hoped it would go away, but like I said, it's been three years and on a hot day, you know, um, you still get a waft every now and then. And uh, we cope with it in a couple different ways. Uh, Mostly we just spend time outside, right? Because you're at the lake, what do you want to do? You want to spend time outside. That's what we're there for. So we stay outside. And uh, when we're inside, we just ignore it. You know, if it's cold and the heat turns on, sometimes you'll get a waft or whatever, but you just, you stay inside. And the only real way to deal with it is to go up in the attic and, you know, face respirator, all that, and take care of it. What is really interesting to me, and this is important, I want you to get this. I killed the problem right? I fixed the problem in that the raccoons are now dead. They're not living. They're not making the mess worse, but the mess has still been made and uh, that mess needs to be cleaned up. And today what I want to talk about is the red flag of not dealing with the earthly consequences of sin. 
And this is a really, really, really big deal. This is such an important thing that so many Christians miss. Christians miss this red flag. We think that when you give your life to Christ, he forgives you, you're clean, washed, and made new. All your sins are forgiven. And that's true, but then we tack this one on the end that's not true. All your problems go away. Oh, I'm a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, I'm new in Christ. And the problem is, your problems don't go away because while God has taken care of the problem of sin, the mess is still there. See, what people don't understand, God calls sin anything that hurts your relationship with God that should say, and hurts your relationship with people. There's something that hurts your relationship with people that doesn't hurt your relationship with God. But typically sin is both of these, right? And uh, there's two parties that are offended. And when the raccoon was in the cabin, there were two parts to cleaning it up. Number one, you had to kill it. And then number two, you had to clean up the mess. When you give your life to Christ, the consequences of sin between you and God are repaired instantly. The raccoon of sin is dead. You are forgiven. But the consequences of sin between you and people on earth, that still needs to be repaired. The raccoon of sin is dead, but the mess, the mess still needs to be cleaned up. You know, we've all met people who have never taken care of that second part. And you meet them and it's a red flag and, and it's awkward because they don't see it. Most people, they don't understand. You give your life to Christ in a moment at a, at a next step class in a sermon, over coffee with a friend, talking with your wife at a conference, at a concert, at a prayer meeting or life group. And you hear all my sins are forgiven, I'm made new and you feel new and there's something that changes on the inside and you are spiritually forgiven, but the earthly consequences of sin, well, they're still there. The raccoon is dead, praise God. The mess has stopped being made worse. God's grace is complete in that sense. But if you don't clean up the mess on earth, there's still gonna be a mess. And so many Christians fail to take care of this little factoid. And what they start thinking is, um, what's wrong with me? I gave my life to Christ, but I still have the mess. It feels a little stinky to be me. Or others think, well, what's wrong with everybody else? I gave my life to Christ and I'm not that person anymore. Why haven't they moved past my past? Biblical examples of this abound. But my favorite example is continuing King David's story. We talked about him last week. He was a great king who deceived himself, right? Remember, he convinced himself that he could sleep with one of his good friend's wife. She got pregnant. And rather than coming to light about it, he decided to murder his friend, Uriah, to conceal his sin, which is like that escalated quickly. And so, you know, it's funny because David thinks he got away with it. Obviously he didn't. Everybody in his family it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be like, wow, Uriah died. David married Uriah's widow instantly. She got pregnant and had a baby that weighed eight pounds after seven months of pregnancy. How did that happen? Oh my goodness. Right? His whole family knows what happened, but eventually this guy named Nathan, I like Nathan. I relate to Nathan in the Bible. His personality and mine are very similar, but Nathan goes to David and is like, God's totally blessed you. He's given you so much. Why have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? And this takes some courage, some fortitude for Nathan to go to the king and say this, to confront him. Why have you done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah. You have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and you stolen his wife. It's interesting that those two are put on the same level. He says, from this time on, your family will live by the sword because you've despised me by taking your eyes wife to be your own. Now, a lot of people think that this line is an example of God cursing somebody. I don't think so. I just think this is the curse of sin. It's the earthly consequence of sin, right? I mean, uh, David deceived himself. He sinned and he totally misses the earthly consequence. The Bible has this book of songs in it called Psalms, the book of Psalms. And many of them are written by David. David is a warrior and a poet and a musician, so cute. And um, every time he has an issue in his life, he's like Taylor Swift, he writes about it, you know, bad breakups and, and so on and so forth. And uh, Psalm 51, David wrote right after Nathan confronts him. And you can see where his headspace is at. I don't want you to miss this, okay? So Nathan confronts David. David goes to his guitar and starts playing. And uh, it says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean of my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. And then get this line, this is important. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. David is nailing nailing the spiritual consequence of sin part, right? He's repenting. He completely misses, ignores the earthly consequence of sin. He's allowing God to kill the raccoon of sin. Praise God. You know, he's owning it. He's admitting it, asking God for grace. 
And God does completely forgive him. But he never takes care of the earthly part of sin. The Bible never mentions David cleaning up the mess. There's no mention of him going to Uriah's mother saying, hey, Mrs. Uriah, I'm so sorry I murdered your son. There's no mention in the Bible of him going to Bathsheba saying, hey, sorry, I murdered your husband and wrecked your life. There's no mention of David going to his adult children and acknowledging his sin, acknowledging his mistake or owning his role and asking for their forgiveness. This is so typical, isn't it? This is the part of sin I think we forget. David just leaves the mess up in the attic and he thinks he's fine. He apologizes to God and he's like, I'm good. And the problem is this produces all kinds of dysfunction in his family. I think some of his family, this is what our families do. They respond in one of two ways. Some family just, they avoid it, right? They just avoid it. They just say, you know what? I, I'm busy. I can't come home. You know, maybe once every other Christmas, you know, when we're not going to her house, we'll come over, but we want to be there as short as possible. We want to leave as soon as possible, right? I mean, that's what we do. I just want to get away from this mess because it smells bad. Or you still get together and you just don't talk about it out loud, but you can't not talk about it on the inside. You know, you see him and, and you get that smell, just, oh, that waft of rotting grossness. It's like, dad, come on. You had everything, everything. Are we really just going to sit here and act like this didn't happen? Like you're amazing. I mean, you were amazing in a lot of ways. You built a great kingdom, David. You did all this cool stuff. But we, why can't you just acknowledge that this happened? Why can't you just acknowledge that you did this, this thing? You know, it stinks. You could ask for forgiveness from us. We could be fine. And not talking about the earthly consequences of sin, what it does is it destroys intimacy. It destroys family connections. It's like going to the cabin and just ignoring the smell. I mean, it's there. Everybody knows it's there. Everybody's like, ugh, you know, it smells bad. It's not pleasant. It's like, are we all just gonna sit here acting like we can't smell it? What everybody does is they put on a smile, eh, like this, you know, eh, yeah, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. We all know families like this. You know, they see each other, but their hearts drift apart slowly. They get together, but they just don't say anything. You know, the only thing we can talk about the weather. We can talk about the deer we got. It's about it. We talk about the new flooring we put in, but that's not like, there's not a lot of variety. It's gray with white trim. You know what I mean? Like everybody does the same thing. And that's it. We just, we can't go. I mean, there's this whole waft of area we can't go to. And what David's family does is their hearts drift apart for years. And eventually they just get sick of it and they start infighting with each other. And ultimately, as an old man, David watches his legacy, his dynasty, and his family destroy itself at the end of his life. And it's just so interesting to watch as he fails to address the earthly consequence of sin. I mean, he totally, completely underestimated the consequences that this failure would have in his life. The earthly consequence of sin is so important. You know, I know a lot of people, this is what they say. They say, um, I'm just gonna sin and I'll ask God for forgiveness. No big deal. I'll just party for a few years. I'll just sow my wild oats, whatever. And then after partying for a while, you know, 23, 24, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna settle down. And it'll all be good. And you know what? God's grace is sufficient. What you don't realize is there is an earthly consequence for sin in your life. God will forgive you, but you're making a mess of your life. Paul, one of Jesus' apostles puts it this way. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more of his wonderful grace? I mean, you could. Of course not though. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? He says, here's what you're doing. Is you're bringing the raccoon of sin into your life and you're making a mess and God will forgive you, but that doesn't take care of the earthly consequences of sin. Over the years, I've seen so many people make this mistake. What they do is they wonder if God loves them. I mean, where is God in all this? You know, you're sitting, where is God in all this? Why is my life such a mess? Why is my family such a mess? Why are my sons and daughters so messed up? As you struggle with co-parenting, as you struggle with an addiction, as you're dealing with these financial issues, you're like, where is God? His grace is sufficient. You are totally and completely forgiven by God. But the earthly mess of sin is there. It's there. It's not that God doesn't forgive you. The spiritual mess is over. The raccoon of sin has been put to death by the grace and work of Jesus. It's totally sufficient. It's complete. But the, the mess that sin leaves on earth... It's real and it's there. David's story is extreme. It's extreme, but it's, it's not rare. I mean, how many of us, we know a matriarch or a patriarch, we are that person. I mean, we see it in our own life. How many stories do we know of people just ignoring the earthly consequences of sin? How many families do we know of that love God deeply and completely and are forgiven by God, but their life has been destroyed by the mess left by sin? That's what happens. And I think what God does is he calls us 
to clean up the mess in our life that comes from the earthly consequences of sin. And I know a lot of you are like, okay, pastor, I mean, this is, this is actually a pretty you know, personal message. I mean, this hits a little close to home. How do I deal with it? And I wanna give you a time-tested biblical process, four steps to dealing with the sin in our life, the earthly consequences of sin. And this, I just want you to know, millions of people have used this process. If you've been to Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll recognize some of these steps. I'm just sort of re-adjudicating them as uh, instead of 12 steps, we're doing them in four. Um, but these are, these are wonderful. It's a wonderful process you can apply to your life. The first step is really simple. You need to make a list of the mess and who it hurt and how. And this is such a great process. So often in my life, I end up in my head because I know I've done something bad, but I don't wanna face it. You know, what happens when you have an earthly consequence of sin in your life and you don't deal with it, you just end up in your head like anxious and upset. And I mean, I can't see up for down, left for right. I'm anxious, I'm lost in my thoughts and I'm, I'm just thinking about everything. My mind is confused and overwhelmed. And what happens at the end, if, if you don't make the list, if you don't get it out there and you just keep it all on the inside, you end up starting to blame other people in your life. The end result of just leaving the earthly consequence of sin in relationship after relationship in your life is you start to feel like a real victim. Oh man, everybody's out to get me, you know, and they, they just never gave me a chance. And I'm just so upset and whatever. So what I like to do is I like to make a list of what I did, who I hurt and how. I actually sometimes will make an Excel spreadsheet of all these things, right? And I know that that sounds lame, but it's what I do. Okay, I'll make the actual process, make an Excel spreadsheet. And so often when I make the list, it is like way worse than I thought it was. Like it's way longer. Like there's so much more. It's like, wow, that is, that's a lot. But when it's done, I feel so much better because I didn't realize how much chaos was in my mind. I mean, all those things, that whole list, just stuff that's clogging my mind at night, you know, inhibiting my ability to interact with people. And when I make that list, oh man, I feel so much better. I feel so much better to just face it, get the fear out of my mind, quantifying what was the unknown. I don't want to go up in the attic to clean up the mess, but once you do, once you clean up that big pile of garbage, man, it feels a lot better to sit and look and be like, wow, it's clean, that's nice. Second thing, confess to God and a wise, godly person. So once you made your list, you go to God and you humbly say, God, will you forgive me for each thing? God, forgive me for this, forgive me for that. In the name of Jesus, I receive forgiveness for each of these things. And then, this is a big deal, you go, you go to a wise, godly person. I typically say somebody who has a track record of faithfulness for a decade or more. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but that's a, it's a great rule of thumb. And you confess the list to them. And the big goal there, you don't want to go to somebody who's just going to, you know, nice, love, peace, and chicken grease. You want to go to somebody who's going to make you own your role. This person should be there to help you own your part. The goal is to make sure that you're not placing blame on others for what you did. So often in life, you know, we want to say, well, I'm a victim. I didn't do anything. At the very least, even if you were victimized by somebody, your role is unforgiveness in this issue. If you're still hurting, your role is unforgiveness. There's nothing in life generally, that it, no hurt in life that we don't carry some portion of guilt for. And you don't want some person, some godly person, some mentor to be like, oh, it's not your fault, you're a victim. What they're doing is they're locking you in that place. You want them to say, it is your fault and you need to own this. And say the hard things that you need to hear. And then they should help you prepare for the next step, step number three, which is go to the people that you've hurt and ask for forgiveness. Ugh, this is one you try and make excuses for. This one's no fun. I don't really need to go to them because they don't want to see me. I don't really need to go to them because they're probably over. They're probably over it years ago. Why would I go to them? Because they're so mean and I can't believe they're not over it. You know, I mean, how long do I really have to sit here and wait for them? I mean, are they still thinking about this? Because I've been over it for a long time. The only exception to going to the person might be if you've abused somebody, if you victimized, like if there's a minor involved sometimes, what you need to do in that circumstance is you write out a letter apologizing and then you give it to God. Sometimes you burn it, whatever. And sometimes, you know, going to the person is not pleasant, it's not fun, but you gotta clean up that mess. And it's critical, this is a big deal, okay? I just gotta say this, it's critical. Um, when you go to them, you don't point out what they did, okay? You don't say, I'm sorry that you took offense. Like, that's not an apology. That's just a punch in the nose. People do it all, I'm sorry that you are so dumb. It's like, oh my goodness, like, no. You just, you're going there to eat a buffet of cat poop sandwiches. That's all you're doing. You're apologizing, you're owning what you did. You're not blaming them. You're just gonna own what you did. And then number four, you are going to make an amends where possible and reasonable. Sometimes it's not possible or reasonable. Sometimes it is. Let me give you an example of an amends I made. Many years ago, when I was a much younger, dumber man, um, I played a prank on this guy's car. And uh, it got a little out of hand. It was one of those things where it's like, man, that, that was supposed to be a prank, but it just turned into outright 
vandalism and crime, right? So I felt convicted for what I did because it was a little extreme. And so I did not get caught, but I went to apologize to him and confess what I had done. But also I brought money and I paid for a car wash in a professional car detailing, right? Because I wanted to make an amends. I didn't just want to say, I'm sorry. I wanted to make it right. And in life, a lot of times we can make an amends with people. Cleaning up a mess is never fun. Sometimes I'm going to be honest with you guys. It doesn't go well. Sometimes we can avoid it for ages, but when you're done and you look at what's been cleaned in your life and you look at your clear mind and you look at it all and it's like, wow, I'm so glad I did that. It was worth it. There's one more step though that I haven't talked about. This is kind of separate from these things. It's just an overarching thing that you need to know. This is where you want to tune back in. This is what might revolutionize um, this whole thing for some of you. This is something that a lot of you guys probably haven't heard of, but uh, when you hurt somebody, sometimes the mess is out of your hands. And this is critical to understand. David could have gone to Uriah's mother. He should have. He should have gone to Uriah's mother and apologized. But listen, there are some wounds that are just really, really deep. And I don't know if she'd have had the strength to forgive him. I mean, we've all seen videos of Christians. Christians have this incredible capacity to forgive because of the Holy Spirit in us. And perhaps she could have forgiven him. But some wounds are really deep. And sometimes you can forgive somebody, but there's still just gonna be woundedness and consequences there. And sometimes the mess is out of your hands. I wanna share a story about this in my own life. A bit personal, but when I met Kristen, I was spellbound, captivated. I was starstruck. I mean, she was everything I could have ever wanted in a woman. And I was specifically pastor's wife hunting. Like, I know that that sounds bad, but I actually had a list that I, you know, amalgamated. I had a strategy. I'm looking for a pastor's wife, right? That's what I did. Is that lame? Yes. Is that a John Hill thing to do? Yeah, totally. That's what I did. Strategically planned. I wanted to, like, I was looking for potential. And I think we can all agree. Kristen is the greatest pastor's wife probably in the country. Every time I meet other pastors and they meet us, they're like, wow, she is an exceptional pastor's wife. I'm like, what about me? Just kidding. That's great. <laughs> but before Kristen and I had met, she had sinned sexually with her exes and some other things as well. And she had cheated on me very early in our relationship. And you know, society says it's toxic and dumb of me to care. I should either like break up with her and move on or forgive her. Here's the problem is secular society has become very anti-science, anti-facts. It's really just a religious movement that ignores data and science. And I love Christianity, right? Because we value science, we value data, we value facts, we value evidence. All the data says that God's plan is best, right? I mean, as sexual partners increase, sexual satisfaction for the rest of life decreases, chances for divorce, um, uh, infidelity and dysfunction all go up, as well as marital, the chances for marital dissatisfaction, right? And because of God's word, because of the data, because of the science, we both now believe that sexual sin, even before you're married, is a sin brought against your spouse. And you know, God bless her, she went straight up to the attic to clean it up. On her third date, you know, we talked about it all. And I'd been saving myself for marriage. And for me, I was like heartbroken. I was like, oh man, that's terrible. But she was kind and humble and she confessed it to me. She asked for forgiveness. And part of the amends that we made was we decided to save sex for marriage in our relationship. Um, because we were determined, I was determined to treat her future husband the way that I wanna be treated. And I've seen enough marriages get called off the day before or the day of even, um, that I'm not doing it. I'm not going down that road. Now, nothing could bring back what was taken but I'm so proud of her for having the courage to walk through that process rather than pretending like it never happened or saying that it doesn't matter, it's in the past, just get over it, God forgave me, why can't you? Those are things that get said a lot. People sometimes talk about how Kristen and I fight all the time, but um, what we're doing, and I'm proud to have a marriage, where we fight to clean up the messes, right? That's what we're doing. We're cleaning up the messes so that we can experience a real level of authentic connection with one another rather than just having the wall raised and not being able to actually connect emotionally. But what she did... She went to the attic to clean up the mess. She put all that raccoon poopy in a bag and then she brought it out to the curb. And here's the thing. This is what I want you to get. This is a big deal. Okay, she brought it out to the curb. I could not let go of it. For years, I was insecure and shut down whenever issues of her past came up. I was hurt. I was drippy. I was defensive. And what I was doing was I was going out to the curb and I picked up the bag that she put there and I was bringing it back into the house. And honestly, in this area of, the life, of our life, it felt like, a lot of rotting garbage bags in the corner of the living room of her marriage. And whenever she'd be like, hey, do you think we should like maybe take those out to the curb? I'd get mad at her and be like, no, not yet. Whose fault was that? We'll be honest, it was 100% my fault. And I could have removed those bags. It was all my fault. But here's the thing, and this is critical. I don't want you to miss this. It was also 100% her fault. Her sin filled those bags in the first place. And sometimes she would get mad at me for holding on to those bags. Why can't you forgive me? God forgave me, right? And I felt terrible for doing it. Oh man, I feel so bad and whatever. Sometimes I'd get mad at her for making those bags in the first place. 
And dealing with this, we got into what I call a crazy cycle conga line of unforgiveness, right? She didn't forgive me. And then I didn't forgive her because she didn't forgive me. And then she didn't forgive me because I didn't forgive her. And it was just spiraling down. Some of you guys have been in a relationship of unforgiveness like this. It's a frustrating process. Just a conga line of misery and dysfunction. What I see today is a lot of people who get mad at others for not forgiving them. And the last part of this cleanup process, the hardest part about this cleanup process is the earthly consequences of sin sometimes are out of your hands. And this is so typical in American society. What we don't realize is that Jesus literally invented unmerited grace and forgiveness. Like most other cultures and societies that are not part of the Christian heritage, they don't understand forgiveness, right? We just take it for granted. But Jesus invented the process of forgiveness. The idea that you would just forgive somebody without making them give you like a camel or whatever, that's not something that existed before Jesus came. Like the idea, we just forgive people. And today we take it so much for granted, we almost expect it. We almost feel entitled to it. I deserve this. But when you sit against somebody and you ask them to forgive you, this, I wanna be clear, it's out of your hands. The definition of forgiveness is grace. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be forgiveness. It would be a wage. Last time I checked, the wage of sin is death, the death of a relationship, the death of a dream, the death of the peace in your mind. That's what sin brings. The gift of God and the gift of godly people is unmerited, undeserved grace. I think what our flesh wants to do is we wanna get mad at the people we have sinned against for not forgiving us. We wanna blame them. We wanna yell at them for being petty. We wanna condemn them and quote scripture at them. But I think overwhelmingly, Jesus calls us to humble ourselves and bear their burdens and forgive them. And I remember three or four years ago, as a result of my insecurity, I was holding on to the same garbage in our marriage. Kristen, in a moment of great love and strength, instead of doing what we were normally doing in our little crazy cycle, she said, John, I love you. And I want you to know, I know that God has forgiven me, but I know that my sin is causing you pain. And I want you to know I care for you as you carry it. I'm not gonna go where you are. I'm not gonna allow um, you know, your hurt to cause me guilt again, but I will wait for you while you're there with compassion and empathy. And it was a nice change from being impatient and upset. And ultimately it was exactly what our relationship needed to break that crazy cycle. I love the way that Paul puts it in Ephesians 4 and verse 31. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, and I love these words, be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I was hurt and insecure because of her sin She was hurt and mad because of my sin against her, but she chose to give me grace, kindness, and tenderheartedness because God had given it first to her. This is like a unique superpower that Christians have. I mean, you look at the rest of the world, it's not really like they're second chances. In most other world movements, most other world cultures, they don't have second chances, but God gives us grace. And because of that, because of God transforming our spirit from the inside out, we can be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ forgave us. And my wife, she chose to be tenderhearted and she daily forgave me. She refused to go to the place where I was at, but she chose kindness and tenderheartedness for me in spite of my shortcomings. She understood that this was the earthly consequence of her sin. It didn't need to be, but because of my weakness, it was what it was. And rather than being mad at me, she forgave me and she lived her life. She waited patiently for me. You know, looking back, I would say it was exactly what I needed. Almost 10 years into our marriage, her kindness and tended heartedness is what allowed me to walk past it. I don't remember exactly when it was, but sometime three or four years ago, I was able to carry those bags to the, tra- or to the curb and let Jesus take them. And it was amazing. So I want to ask you one big question as we wrap this up. And I really want you to meditate on this. Just one big question for you. Even if you're not a Christian, I think this is a helpful question that could bless your life. I wanna ask you, where in your life do you have messes to clean up? The earthly consequence of sin is real. I know there's some of you here, you have been ignoring a mess in your attic for years. You know this there. Your loved ones know that it's there. While you know that God forgave you, perhaps it's time to deal with it for the people here on earth. I want you to know that it's worth it. 
I want you to know what you're costing yourself, which is intimacy with people in your life. I wanna challenge you to have the courage to walk up into that attic and to deal with it. I want you to relentlessly, bravely, and courageously do what it takes to deal with it, to go to the people, to make your list, to make an amends. Others of you, you've been hanging on to garbage bags just like I was. You know, people have asked you for forgiveness and you're just hanging on to it. Listen, throw them out. You know who's hurt most as you hang on to those bags of unforgiveness? You. You. God literally calls us to forgive. He says, unless you forgive others, I won't forgive you. I want to challenge you to forgive. All you're doing is you're hurting yourself, you're hurting the ones you love the most, and you're making your life stink. And for me in my life, it was a process. Like, look, it wasn't like I'd just be like, all right, insecurity gone, I forgive. It was like a morning by morning process. God, I receive your forgiveness. I choose to forgive. I choose to believe that I am who you define me to be. Lastly, there's some of you here, you're mad at somebody who is holding on to those bags, like my wife was mad at me for holding on to those bags. And I wanna challenge you to be patient. Remember that it's not just them. You made the garbage. You don't deserve forgiveness. It's not a wage, it's a gift of grace. And you don't have to go there with them, but have grace for them, choosing kindness and tenderheartedness, continuing to live your life. I really hope and pray that you guys will have the courage to actually take action because of this message. I hope you're not like, can you believe he left that raccoon in his attic for for three years? I mean, is it still there? What I really hope is you're gonna say, I'm gonna deal with the raccoons in my attic. I'm gonna deal with the issues in my life. God's love for me is great. My love for the people closest to me in my life is great. I wanna deal with it because I wanna leave a better story and a better legacy than King David did with his family. Deal with the earthly consequences of your sin. As we close, I wanna ask you at all of our locations to stand to your feet and uh, I will pray, but before I do, I want you to just receive the word of God. I want you to just receive Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. This is real powerful. I want you to get this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Let's have a prayer together. God in heaven, I ask that through this message series and today's specific message, I ask that you would heal broken relationships. Lord, for people that need to, I ask that you'd give them the courage to ask for spiritual forgiveness for their sins. That they would turn to you receiving the grace that you freely give. God, for others of us who have received that spiritual grace, but we have forgotten about the earthly consequences of sin, would you give us the courage and the vision to see places in our life? We've got messes to clean up. Open our minds and hearts to people that we've hurt. God, I ask that you would remove roadblocks to intimacy and deep, fulfilling relationships through this message. Help us to humble ourselves and walk in kindness and tenderheartedness, forgiving others just as God through Christ has forgiven us. In the name of Jesus, we ask and pray these things. All God's people said, amen and amen. We've got a last song to sing together. Let's sing it.